Hey, John, how's it going? Uh, uh, how are you? Good, Brandon. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Uh, well, well, first and uh, foremost, uh, thanks for taking the time to uh, speak with uh, Real Film News today. Uh, sure. I guess I'll start by asking you, um, you know, you tackled various genres over the course of your career. However, with this film, you know, you faced the added challenge of putting together a theme for a person who was, you know, real and not fictional. So right. uh, how did you approach or how did you begin your process with this film when you started? Um, coming to this film, you know, I, I did approach it with caution in terms of the theme that uh, I ultimately had to write for Steve Jobs. I mean, obviously, this guy is an icon. Uh, he's one of the most, probably one of the most brilliant guys of the 20th century, no question. So, in approaching what became Steve's theme, I really felt I had to wrap my head around what type of a guy he was. And that took me on a journey that really kind of started with reading everything I could about him. And it took me to things in places like uh, Mac stores and trying to kind of just soak in what it was that he, you know, the, the sort of the width and breadth and, and height of what he created. Um, and ultimately what came out was a theme that was um, not an obvious theme, but I, I like to describe it sort of like a theme that goes places. It sort of goes, it, it's continually kind of moving upwards. And ultimately, the, the theme, without being too vague, um, was a theme that sort of expressed Steve's, you know, inner inner passion for creating or bettering mankind. And I think that ultimately that's what I strove to do, and that's sort of what the theme represents. The theme rep represents that nobility of Steve, that he was really trying to create something for the betterment of all of, all of us. Okay. All right. Awesome. Uh, so, so the next question I would have is, uh, you know, you've been quoted as saying that you wanted to create a score that had, uh, I understand, nobility and scope to it. So um, how did you accomplish that, uh, with the score that is, how did you accomplish that without making it overpowering or, or overbearing for, uh, on the film? Well, that, that's a great question. Um, that was a challenge, honestly, um, every step of the way, you know, how, how big does one make this uh, music? And really, the, the score ended up being a, a collage of a lot of things. There, there were moments where it was sort of harkens back to 70s rock and roll, um, mm -hmm. other areas where it's really unabashedly sort of classical in nature. And, you know, in other places where it sort of gets lofty and, and large in scope. And there are only a couple places in the film really where I felt and the director, Josh, and I felt that um, we could get the music to be kind of soaring. Okay. And one of them was, um, just if memory serves me right, one of them was at the, uh, the 1984 commercial that, um, that Apple created, and in that sort of showing the work, inner workings of how they created that, that you know, really iconic commercial, um, that was one place in particular where we felt we could really let the music soar. And it was sort of, in that way, it was sort of one of Steve's iconic moments. And I think that throughout the film, there are a few of those moments where we really kind of let it soar. But, but it's always, we were always also realizing that we had to keep it rather restrained because he was sort of restrained like that in, in the way that he would not necessarily, at least to my knowledge, he would not necessarily uh, express, um, you know, a lot of sort of emotion in the traditional sense. Uh, so we always had to bear in mind that the music had to play its role, but, but oftentimes we never let it get too big. Only a couple times in the film we 
really let it go, as it were. Gotcha, gotcha. Uh, well, well, to add to that, I think you you kind of answered it to to some degree, you know, just now. Um, in using the score, in, in what way will you say that you encapsul- encapsulated a uh, 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 job's um, uh, life? Did, did, did you create, or I should say, how did you create that nuance um, for the score? Did you base it uh, on eras within his life, or or uh, did, did you base it upon, you know, the various uh, the various um, titles that he had within his life on, on how, you know, people uh, uh, people viewed him? Well, that's a great question. Um, I really let the music sort of, it, I, I felt the best thing to do or the most obvious thing certainly was to let the era sort of dictate, you know, what the music would be. And I, and I think that was right. In other words, the music follows the journey from Steve in, in the garage with the guys in the 70s mm-hmm. all the way to the advent and, and the introduction of the, the iPod. So it the music goes on the same sort of path that he did. It, it starts a little more sort of uh, rock and roll or poppy, acoustic rock, as it were. And then as we go through it, the music gets a little more sophisticated, a little more... Um, modern sounding um, and that's kind of what we did we sort of I just followed Steve through through the eras and strangely the music sort of reflected each each what I think each um, sort of ha- uh, what would you call it each part of his life in terms of his um, what was going on around him um, but very interesting and, and yet Sometimes within the course of one piece of music, there might be some Eastern-influenced music, there might be some electronic music in, inside. Because of his, the complexity of his character, we sort of did the overt thing where, where the music follows the arrow, but then it also follows his internal um, emotional life, too. And I think sometimes the music reflects that. It reflects his inner angst and... Um, you know, it just everything he was going through. So, quite a mixed bag. It's one of the sort of most eclectic scores that I've done in a long time, where it, mm. where it marries a lot of different um, styles sort of into one, one, what I hope is one unified whole. Okay, all right. Well, well terrific. Well, well, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Debney, for your for your time. And uh, what, what, what can fans um, uh, see your work in next? Or where, where can we hear, you know, more of your work in, in the uh, films in the next few years? Well, I'm really, thankfully, very busy. So we've got jobs that's coming out, you know, in about a week. And then I've got a rather large mini series that I'm working on. It's really good called Bonnie and Clyde. It's, a, you know, a big mini series on the life of Bonnie and Clyde. Okay. And then, which is going to be, I think, really cool. And then after that, I've got something called Eliza Graves, which is, um, I'm reuniting with the director from The Call. Oh, okay. Yeah, he's doing a very cool period thriller uh, with starring, starring Kate Beckinsale, so that that's going to be fun. So there's a lot coming up, and I, I hope the fans will enjoy it. Great. Well, again, uh, thanks for your time, and uh, take care. Thanks, man. Thanks for the great question.